Well, precious ones, you'd be so kind, open up your Bibles to Old Testament, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. Now, if you divide your Bible like I do, just about the middle of your Bible, you're going to hit Psalms. Okay? If you hit the book of Psalms, go to the right. You'll run right into Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23 is the chapter that we're going to be reading from. I welcome you to Midway Baptist Church. If you're not a member, I dearly hope that you are praying about that. Because every Christian needs a church home. Amen? A place to grow, to be known, and to serve the living God. We're more than just rats in a rat race in this life. And I want us to come. Last week, we preached out of Isaiah 59. And we looked at the condition of our nation. And we came through the scriptures to look at the solution, the cause of the trouble, and with the solution. The cause is, is that truth has fallen in the streets and we need to lift up the truth of the scriptures we need to lift up the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and I want us to come and follow on that theme today and I want you to is going to look specifically at one verse Proverbs chapter 23 I reckon I should get there myself huh Verse 23, and the Bible says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Without the truth, you will not have wisdom. Without the truth, you cannot be instructed. And without the truth, you're not going to have understanding. Buy the truth and sell it not. Now, I'm going to read it again. It's a real complex verse. Buy the truth and sell it not. Now, let me give you a word of overview. You ready? Just a few takeaways off of this verse before we shell the peas. There's five things I want, you to, I want you to be thinking about. First of all, that verse declares that by nature, naturally, we do not possess the truth. You got that? He says, go and buy it. You buy stuff you already have? Don't answer that. All right? So by nature... By nature, actually by our fallen nature, we do not possess the truth of the living God naturally. It's not intuitive. The truth I program myself intuitively to go by, if it's not anchored in Scripture, is wrong. No matter how it feels or how it looks. Number two, this truth has got to be valuable because you're going to buy it. He says, go and buy it. Spend what you need to spend. Because only a fool or somebody who likes flea markets and garage sales. <laughs> oh, I'm picking on everybody today. Buy stuff that's worthless. Right? Don't tell me it's worthless. I sold it at my garage sale. <laughs> it never ends. Number three. If you're going to buy it, it has to be from the lawful owner. Otherwise, it's theft. So the one who possesses the truth is the only one who can sell the truth. Number four, to buy it, you have to be willing to part with something of value. If you're going to buy something, you've got to give up something. And number five, you're never to sell it. 
You're never to sell it. You know, there's very few things in this world that we would not buy and resell. For one thing, our home. You know, man, they keep showing all these prices of homes. I told Beck, first one that offers this amount of money, we gone. We'll even leave the dog if they want it. I said, now I just want you to know. She said, where are we going to go? I said, I don't know. I, I didn't say we leave in town. I just said we leave in here. See, this truth that we're going to buy, by the nature of that statement, has to increase in value. Because you're never going to sell it. Because it's too valuable. There's no, there's no amount that can be given worth you giving it up no matter what those treasures are. That's some big questions, ain't it? So now we, now we have to answer, now that we're just looking at that in a snapshot, by the truth. Well, the question is, what is truth? That's a big debate in our nation. It's always been the debate with mankind ever since, ever since Eve. You know this, who? I mean, they're resurrecting the ERA, the equal rights stuff. It's really just Eve rebels again. It's from the very beginning. Just rejecting what God said. I'm pushing all the buttons. I love it. I love it. So what are you going to do? What is truth? What is truth? Well, you remember Pilate? When they brought Jesus before him? Jesus, he, Pilate looked at him, he said, are you the king of the Jews? He says, that's what you say. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my followers would fight. And then he, then he said, well, then why in the world are you here? He said, because I've come to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate said this, what is truth? And before Jesus could answer, Pilate walked out. You go back and read it in John chapter 18, verses 37, 38. He walks out and he goes to the folks and he says, I find no fault in this man. You see, coming to be serious about the truth is a very dedicated issue you'll really not find transformational truth a little bit here and a little bit there. The Bible says, the Bible says this about what is truth. You ready? We're going to write them down quick. Number one, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says that the Bible is the word of truth. The Bible is the word of truth. In John 14, 6, it says Jesus is the person of truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I don't have some truth, I am the truth. I am the substance and sum total of truth. Why? Because he's the creator. Everything that was made was made by him. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John 14, 17, that the Holy Spirit in interprets for us and teaches us the truth of the word of truth from the son of truth. The Bible says in Isaiah 65, 16, that God is the God of truth. The Bible says there's no lie in God. And that the church, it's amazing how church has got a bum rap. It serves no purpose. Folks, you know why in this country they can put, they could lump, the government could just lump churches as not essential, just like everything else? Because we don't proclaim truth. We don't proclaim truth. Because the Bible says this, that the church is the pillar of truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. And so we've been getting our heads around what all that means. Now, are you with me? Because you see, for me to talk to you about buying truth until you understand the necessity of truth seems, seems like, oh, well, that's nice. But it's not, 
It doesn't compel me. Sunday school's nice, but it's not essential. Wednesday night Bible studies with the kids and all the adults, well, you know, that's a good thing, but eh, hit and miss. What is so important about it? Are you ready? Guys, listen, I'll preach a lot faster if y'all think quicker. Okay? All right? You see, see, the Bible says this in Proverbs 14, 12, that there is a way that seems right to a person. There's a way that seems right. Every person in here has a worldview. Your worldview is the sum total of how you process events. You have a basis of truth that moves all your decisions. All your decisions come off of this. And the Bible says there's a way that seems right to you. Not wrong, but right. And the end of that reasoning and following those decisions leads to death. Leads to death. That I wasn't trying to do wrong, but my marriage failed. I wasn't trying to do wrong, but these things. And you know what? I keep trying to do right, and my, my life is a train wreck. Even after I've given my life to Jesus. Why? Because all of us, by the time we're saved, have a certain biblical, have a certain worldview. I build my life on my beliefs. And if my beliefs are wrong and they're not based on eternal truth, then the outcome is going to be bad. Coming, growing up on the bayou. In the house, the old Cajun world, inside the home, mom cooked. Mom cooked. But if you went on the porch or under the carport, that's where dad cooked. Or if you went to the trapping camp and the hunting camp, it was amazing how the men, even as a little boy, I'd watch them, they'd all fuss. Radote, they would call that. Nobody was going to come to blows, but oh my goodness. About who could cook what. And you know what they would do? They would taste it. Yeah, you would cook a jambalaya and they would taste it. They never blamed the rice. They never blamed the shrimp. They never blamed the sauce. They always blamed the person who put in the ingredients. Why you did that? Why you put, well, I thought it would do it. You don't have no sense. The problem is, in life, without the word of God, led by the Spirit of God, following the Son of God, we do things and we see too late. It didn't make sense. Let me show you what I mean by that. You ready? And then we're going to look at how to buy the truth and how not to sell out. Because there's a lot of pressure, my friend, that's going to be put on you and your children at work, at home, at school, to sell out on the truth in these days right now. So, so here's what happens. You ready? He says, he says, the sum total of what I act on, there's a way that seems right, but the end thereof leads into destruction. Let me give you a couple of examples of how this world views certain views, world views, Number one, the one who has the most toys wins. That your life is all dependent upon on what you own. On what you own. Guys, we work one job, we work two jobs. It's for stuff. You've got to buy it. You've got to have it. Here's what you're going to do. We go into debt. Not to sustain, but to satisfy some craving that we have. It's called materialism. It's called materialism. And folks, 
the truth of the Word of God, let me tell you what the truth of the Word of God does. Not only is my soul saved, but my mind is transformed. That the Word of God begins to reorganize and restructure my thoughts. Because the argument is, well, wait a minute, what's wrong with that? Well, Luke 12, 15 says, And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things they possess. We can spend our lives pursuing stuff. <coughs> if I have more, I'm more. You know that. You know that. The car we drive, the clothes we wear, man, there's pressure on that. There's pressure on that. Materialism. The Lord says, look, I want to change you for eternal things. Okay? How about this one? Do whatever feels good. Just do whatever feels good. Live a life for pleasure. If it feels good, do it. How many people say, well, it, didn't, it doesn't feel wrong to me? I had a guy committing adultery on his wife years ago when I was a younger pastor. And I called him into account. I said, what are you doing? He says, let me just tell you, it may be a sin to you, but it's not a sin to me. It, it doesn't bother me. I said, I got two things to ask you. Number one, what is wrong with you? And number two, why are you not dead? I can't believe your wife didn't shoot you yet. I was younger. I was younger. I wasn't. Now they'd say, you've incited her to kill her husband. I bet I'm not the first one that put that thought in her head. <laughs> but no, I don't want her to do that. If it feels good. Guys, Proverbs 21, 17 says, He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. Why? Because the pursuit of pleasure leads to boredom. Now, I'm not telling you not to do things that are pleasing. I'm telling you, I am telling you this mad scramble to get to a point in my life where I do nothing but please myself is completely unbiblical. It's completely unbiblical. That, and it's so effective that I'm saying things that are making you think I'm wrong right now. I'm talking about your life philosophy. What moves? It draws you in everything you're going to do. Look, that's why so many times you look this up in the Bible, Jesus would say, you've heard it said, but I'm telling you. You've heard it said, but I'm telling you. This is the way it is. And guys, Jesus got rejected. He said, am I your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Oh, let me tell you, buddy. I'll be a Christian, but I ain't changing how I process and live my life. Then, beloved, you're either not a Christian at all or God's fixing to bring some, some correction into your life. Because all of us have a measure of stinking thinking. Amen? My whole life, God's trying to reorganize how I think. How about this one? You ready? I'll give you a few more. I've got to think for, of me first. Hey, I've got to think of me first. I had a deacon in the first church I ever served in told me something like that. He came, as I had been there almost a year. He invited me to his house. I knew something was up. I was young. But I grew up knowing shysters. And I went to his house and he was buttering me up one side and down the other. I was figuring, okay, he's fixing to eat a young pastor sandwich. And here's what he told me. He said, you need to understand something. I said, okay. He said, he who toots, 
He who does not toot his own horn, his own horn does not get tooted. I thought that was an interesting thought. First of all, you don't hear that many toots in one sentence. And so I had to, I had to slow it down and repeat it some. What he was telling me was, enough, man, you got to promote yourself. It's a you first world. That's what it is. That's called individualism. Do whatever you feel. That's called, that's called hedonism. But the part of thinking of me first is all about you. It doesn't matter if you swore to God that you would love that wife your whole life till you were dead. It doesn't matter if your children are crying that they don't want you to leave. You got to think about you. I heard a lady one time tell me over the years she had gone to another church and then she came back here and she told me, she said, I want you to know you were wrong to try to help our marriage to stay together. She said, went to this place and here's what they taught me. And I said, okay. They said, God wants, you to, God wants me to be happy. I'm not happy in this marriage. And because God wants me to be happy and the only way I can be happy is to be out of this marriage, God wants me to divorce him. Now listen, I'm saying these things on purpose. You know why? Because every time you pause and to, to argue with me in your mind, let that be a declaration statement of saying, Lord, I haven't, I need some cleaning up in my head. Okay? Lord, I need some help. Now I can tell you how the Holy Spirit helped me with that statement. I said, ma'am, chapter and verse, you showed me one verse that God says, I want you to be happy. God wants you to be holy. And when you're holy, you're going to be happy. I ain't telling you that he ain't a deadbeat, but he's your bum. And there's no biblical grounds. There are biblical grounds to get a divorce. She didn't have none. Listen, it's not a new thing. It's an old thing. I got to look at me first. Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. It says, for whoever... Desires, Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, to follow the truth, you have to abandon yourself to the truth. And sometimes it seems kind of weird, don't it? I remember I had come back from being overseas and preaching and I had some, I had some, gastrointestinal distress issues. And I went to this doctor and they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And I said, what's that? Pray tell. He said, I got this pill and you're going to take it and it's going to kill everything living in your body. I said, that sounds like I'm dead too. <laughs> he said, no, but you're going to kind of feel like that. Well, you know what? I was going to take that pill. And I said, wait a minute, I got a wife. She can take that pill. <laughs> you know, husbands are good about that, aren't they? Right? But I would never do that. You ever made your wife taste the milk to see if it was rotten? <laughs> I'm not sure if this orange juice is good, sugar. Would you check? Now, that's a natural move. You know why? Because mom has got immunities to that stuff. That's why they're moms. What you going to do? I took the pill. I took the pill. I died six times. I came back every time. Nobody wanted me. Just picking. I need, to, I need to move. I'm running out of time. I need to get, I knew I'd do this. Whatever feels good, think of me first. Individualism. How about this one? God doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. There's no God. 
Or if it does exist, it doesn't matter. Now, now, you do realize, right, that it's becoming stylish to avoid the word atheist. And they like using the word naturalist now. I'm just a naturalist. I'm just a naturalist. Well, I just want to remind you of something. God's got a real short answer to all that. In Psalm 14, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The Bible says this in Romans 1, starting in verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, even the Godhead, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that all are without excuse. And because they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful but it became futile in their thoughts and foolish hearts were darkened. Possessing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Guys, I can understand an honest atheist. I really do. Hey, I'm an atheist. Well, do you want to know if there's a God? Problem is, too many atheists already know there's a God and they're avoiding him like a thief avoids a cop. Because if you ever run into one of these folks, the easiest things to say, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to say, are you the smartest man that ever lived in this world? Just tell me. Do you know everything? Do you know everything? If they say yes, I normally respond. Well, tell me the middle name of my grandma. Because if you miss that, you don't know everything. And of course they don't. And they'll say, well, I said, listen, I'm not mad at you. I'm not even offended. I'm just full of sorrow for you. I said, but here's the bottom line. I'm going to give you credit that you are the smartest person that's ever lived. You are 1,000 times smarter than Albert Einstein. And you know half of everything that could ever possibly be known and will ever know. You think maybe God is in the other half you didn't see yet? You see, you can't be absolute. And here's the sad thing. You ready? The only value you have as a person is if there's a God who made you. If not, you're just pond scum. You're just an accident. It doesn't matter whether you live or not. When you, don't, when, when you don't function anymore, we need to get rid of you. Or if you're a burden, we just get rid of you. There's no purpose to your life. It is the Lord that gives us purpose. Amen? How about this one? And then I'm going to move on. I just want you... These are some of the world belief systems... They come to us and we process them in different ways. If you are not under the word of God as a believer, you are not being transformed in your mind. You're guessing. And you're passing up blessings. There is a call for us to rightly divide the word of God. How about this one? Well, you know, whatever works for you. Whatever works for you. I would never do that, but who am I to tell you? Who am I to tell you? That is so stylish. That sounds so wonderful, dealing with, especially with the perversion movement in America, the renaming and retitling of what wrong into right. Whatever works for you. That's called pragmatism. And the big push of pragmatism is moderation, isn't it? It's okay to drink, just don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. Well, I never get drunk. If you believe that, if you believe that, who would have a higher standard or more cautious standard about being drunk? A born-again believer or a Jesus-rejecting society? Born-again believer, right? Right? Because the Bible is clear, drunkards go to hell. If you're a drinker, or if you're with somebody who's a drinker, you can get this stuff on your phone now. Have them drink a glass of fortified wine. 
Have them blow into the thing. See if they're not legally drunk. Oh, but, but if you wait a while, yeah, everybody sobers up. Do you understand? Pragmatism, moderation is not the answer of things. Moderation. Now, you see, some of you are not going to come back next Sunday because of what I said about liquor. You're going to walk away and say, oh, I don't agree with that. How's it working out for you? It's a serious thing. See, pragmatism, moderation, everything in moderation, everything in moderation. Ladies, you're comfortable with having him have him be moderately unfaithful? Is that okay? Just, I don't know. What, what, what would moderate adultery be? Once every six months? Is that okay? You come to my office. For me, arsenic is bad. But you know, it might work for you. I'll just give you half a teaspoon in the coffee. What do you think? Say, Brother Dennis, you're being silly. I'm trying to make a point. And the point is, is that this world puts their system 24-7 into your mind and into your children, and you're not allowed to speak against it. Not at work, not at school, not in Congress. And if you do, we're going to cancel you. We're going to shut you down. And I'm telling you, our children in this generation needs to hear that God's got a better answer than those things. They owe pragmatism. They owe pragmatism. In Proverbs 14, 2 says, There is a way that seems right to a man. The end thereof is destruction. Okay, I've gone. But there's another line of truth. Is that, that God has a purpose and He's given us His Word. I love what the Bible says in Colossians 1.16, For by Christ all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. You want to find your purpose, darling? Follow Jesus. You want to find the, the reason of life? Look, life is tough. Life is tough. And it, and it doesn't mean because we're born again believers that life doesn't come at us in a hard way. But God comes and He shows and He speaks so clearly. So here's what I want us to do. You ready? What are we supposed to do? First of all, he says this, we need to buy the truth. You need to buy it. You need to buy it. To buy it means simply this. You ready? It means it belongs to you. It's your truth. You know what I've found as a pastor for a long time? Come on, say what? Most folks borrow truth. You can't borrow my truth that I live by. When my little boy, when Ethan was, was young, and he would want to watch football, and we'd sit down together, and, and, and he would say, Dad, who we want to win, the red team or the white team? And I'd say, the red team. Yeah, we hate those white teams. <laughs> and of course, mom would yell from the kitchen, we don't hate anybody. <laughs> but then there came a day. See, what was he doing? He was borrowing my beliefs. And that's okay when you're little. What child would not want to love who daddy loves? But there comes a day when they're legs get longer and their wings get shorter, that I remember him asking me, Dad, who do you want to win? And I said, I'm going to take the red team. 
And he said, ah, I think I'm going to go with the guys in, in white. And I remember I didn't say anything to him, but I knew that there was a passing of time that had happened. He wasn't borrowing my beliefs anymore. And of course, my team won. <laughs> you see, be careful. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Say, Brother Dennis, I don't even know if I do. Do you want to be honest? Jesus said, if you'll search for me with all your heart, you'll find me. There's not a person who's ever said, I want to know if Jesus is real, that has not been brought to that place. Because the very act of asking the question, Jesus said, no man comes to me except the Father first draws him. Jesus died so sinners like me and you could be born again. The problem is never on Jesus' side. Amen? But if you're going to buy, let me tell you, it's a deliberate act on your part. It's voluntary. Nobody can make you do it. You've got to do it. Buy the truth. All the truth. But then, do you know all the truth in the Bible? I'm constantly seeing something. But truth never doubles. Knowledge doubles. My knowledge of the Bible doubles, but the truth is always the truth. It's always there. I never make the truth. You discover the truth. Are you willing to buy? All I know of me, Lord, I'm giving all I know of you. If you're going to be a disciple, it's going to take time. It's going to take study. It's going to transform your life. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how it works. By the truth. By the truth. Lay hold to Christ and let him work inside of you by his spirit. And here's the other part. Don't sell it. Buy it at any price, no matter what it cost. And sell it for no price. Because it's priceless. Buy the truth. How do people... What would make us sell the truth? What would make us sell the truth? Selfishness? Will? My own sin in my life? Will make us sell the truth? What makes a young lady who loves the Lord sell her purity? To a guy or vice versa because you decided to love somebody more than you loved the Lord whose truth whose truth the decisions will always come down you see the Bible you're going to face this in order for peace in your own family and who would not want peace amen Are you willing to dilute the truth? To deny the truth? Rather than live the truth? See, I'm not going to be your policeman. I'm not going to live your life, but brother, I'm going to live mine. I'm going to live mine. Some people sell out for peace. Some for popularity. You know... Not everybody's going to follow you when you follow Christ. I'm not talking about being a can't-get-along, cantankerous, aggravated Baptist. I'm not talking about those people. I'm not talking about being a woman who fights with the neighbors just to stay in shape till her husband gets home. And then you get ready so you could fight more when you get to church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in your heart. You want to have a place that's loving and kind. But there are going to be people that are going to walk away from you just like they walked away from Jesus. 
You know, the Bible said, let me read this passage to you. In just a moment, I'm going to be calling Brother Braylon and Miss Becca up because it's decision time with these messages. Say, so, well, if I knew what all the truth was, then I'll buy it ahead of time. I'm sorry, it don't work that way. It doesn't. In John chapter 6, listen to this. John chapter 6, verse 65. The Bible says, Jesus said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They were done. Then Jesus said to the twelve, he said, Do you also want to go away? You're leaving too? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words to eternal life. And so we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, beloved, some people for popularity will sell out. Some people for position. And I do understand there are, certain, there are certain job promotions you will not get because you're a follower of Christ. God could put you anywhere. But I'm not going to tell you that there's not a price to pay on that. I am telling you is there's no price worth paying to get that. Because God's got every plan in place. Some people do it for power. Okay, any of y'all ever watched uh, the show Good Eats that used to come on TV? Uh, a brown guy, Alton Brown, Brown was his name. And Beck, Beck was saying, you know, I mean, we used to watch that. It was like, oh, you know how the molecular structure, how it works here? No, I never thought of that. Anyway, and he would show. I said, well, let me see if he's still living. Whether this was actual or not, it's quoted from him. He said, I used to be a Southern Baptist. But in 2014, I stopped. Because of their position on homosexuality. Now I'm searching for a new belief system. It made me sad. Why? Because it's not a Methodist thing, a Baptist thing. It's just biblical truth. Amen? It's just biblical truth. Some for power, some positions. So what am I telling you to do today? Here's some decisions that born-again believers need to make. It's time to rededicate your life. Say, God, I want to go back and straighten out stinking thinking. I need a better biblical worldview. You know why? Because even though I come to church, my life just keeps circling in the same garbage. The Bible tells us, buy the truth and sell it not. It's as straightforward as this. Know it in your head. Make a decision that you're going to start reading and memorizing Scripture. Know it in your head. If I was to ask you a question, you ready? How many of you, don't raise up your hand, come on, because you know I'm tricking you. All right? How many of you are angry that they refuse to allow the Ten Commandments in schools? I'd be willing to say a lot of you said, that's just wrong. Flip side. If I was to call on you right now, how many of you could tell me the Ten Commandments? I'm going to do it. I'm going to call you out. Block the doors. <laughs> Ain't that something? I'm telling you, it's the way we're wired. We need God's help. We need to know the word. We need to stow it 
in our hearts. We need to meditate on it. We need to show it in our lives. That the world can see what Jesus is doing. And so can our families. And not only that, we need to sow it in the world around us. Live the truth. Live the truth. People are going to start to ask you, what's the hope that's in you? So as we come right now in this place, right now, as Brother Braylon runs on up and Miss Becca waddles. <laughs> Stop. She's, she's not a snowflake. I've told her far worse. Listen to me. In a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to open this up if you want to come for prayer. There's some people in this room. And you know, I need Jesus as my Savior. Right there, privately, where you're sitting, you can call to Christ. For with the heart, man believes. What do you believe? That I'm a sinner and He's the Savior. Amen? But the same God who said that in Romans chapter 10, with the heart man believes, also says with the mouth, salvation comes by confession. That Jesus Christ is Lord. You and I don't get to rewrite that part of truth. Do you understand? That's why we call you to come forward. If you won't come confess that Jesus Christ is your Savior in here, where are you going to do it? Ah, but I'll just stop. Just agree. Agree with God. Amen? I'm shy. Who cares? Really? Turn your eyes to the Savior. Amen? We're going to stand in a moment. We're going to sing, I've decided to follow Jesus. Some need to come confessing Christ. I just, want, I just want Jesus to be my Savior. Today, all I know of me, I'm giving all I know of Him. There's some in this room, you need to get your family back under the Word. You need a church home. You're looking for hope. We serve a God of hope. we got plenty to spare. I'm not afraid of the darkness. I just want to stand in the light. Amen? With love and power and make a difference in this hurting world. That's the purpose we serve, to honor the Lord. I invite you to come. Just say, Brother Dennis, we would love to sit down and talk with you and find out if this is where God would have us to be. There's some in this room and you've got family. You just want to come up here and pray. You can pray from where you're sitting. Yes, you can. Unless the Holy Spirit prompts you to turn this into an altar. God gives grace to the humble. So what's God calling you to do today? By the truth. Jesus paid the price that it's available. All I know of me, I'm giving all I know of Him. I want to be born again. Will you come? Come on, let's stand right now.